Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the program on constitutional government, and our speaker today is Peter Wood. Peter Wood is president of the National Association of Scholars. He has a distinguished history. He graduated from Haverford College and got his uh, PhD in anthropology from the U University of Rochester and taught in the uh, anthropology department in Boston University, was the provost of King's College uh, in New York, and, uh, and, that, and, and now holds his, uh, his present position as president of the National Association of Scholars. He is the author of A Bee in the Mouth, Anger in America Now, and Diversity, which came out in 2003 and was the occasion of a previous invitation to come and talk to us in uh, 2004. And now, as president of uh, the National Association of Scholars, he's produced uh, a, a series of wonderful reports on American uh, university education. The first one was, uh, what is Bowdoin teaching now? Is that, what does yeah. Bowdoin teach? What does Bowdoin teach? And was, I think this is the best study of uh, the complete life of a liberal arts college uh, in America. So I very much recommend that you um, read this, I, which you, I, I think you can do from the uh, website of the NAS. And then he uh, produced this um, a, a report on sustainability, which is the subject of his talk today. And he's got another one that came out, I think, on Tuesday called uh, um, Inside Divestment, a study of uh, the divestment movement uh, that's been uh, uh, roiling our universities. So uh, let's welcome uh, Peter Wood and his topic, the idea of sustainability. Thank you, Harvey. Um, sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Those are the words of the Brundtland Commission report, Our Common Future, the report of the World Commission on Environment and Development in 1987. That was the first notable use of the concept of sustainability. The word wasn't coined there, but it uh, vaulted it from a relatively obscure idea into something that people needed to conjure with. Uh, Daniel Bonavec, who is a professor of philosophy at the University of Tes Texas, Austin, in an essay uh, titled, Is Sustainability Sustainable?, which he published in my journal, Academic Questions, uh, writes that the Brundtland sustainability test is either easily satisfied or utterly implausible. He draws a uh, special weight to the words of uh, the uh, compromising and the needs of this thing. Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. The problem here is that compromise can be taken to mean something like it will be impossible for future generations to meet their needs, in which case the uh, test that the sustainability doctrine poses uh, is one that, which has an easy answer. We're not going to do anything that makes it impossible for future generations to exist. You could set the idea of compromise at a, uh, a lower level, that anything that impedes or uh, and to some degree makes things more difficult for future generations needs to be ruled out. But in that case, we run into the problem that we cannot anticipate what the needs of future generations might be in any great detail, in which case we're utterly paralyzed. We can't do anything or expend any resources for fear that we might be harming somebody in a later generation. Uh, that makes the definition of sustainability at least philosophically awkward. There have been other attempts to define it, but the Brundtland Commission report remains the, the gold standard and variations of that definition are applied widely. A few other definitions, to, just to fill in the picture, Atkinson, sustainability is development that lasts. Eakins and Newby, the capacity for continuance more or less indefinitely into the future. Ehrenfeld, the possibility that humans and other life will flourish on Earth 
forever, uh, which seems to deny the facts of astronomy. Um, these definitions shade from large, finite time to infinite time scales, as Bonavec puts it, and involve a fallacy of claiming knowledge that no one can possibly have about the future to derive the conclusion that anything that does not reduce the human population or its resource use is approaching to approaching zero is unsustainable. Um, definitional quandaries aside, there would be slight interest in this concept uh, if it were just a marginal cult or some obscure academic specialization. That's clearly not the case. Sustainability is now a cause that draws hundreds of billions of dollars and drives government policies worldwide, as well as the planning and direction of large corporations, of churches, such as the Catholic Church, and of course, colleges and universities. Now, I assume that that's not something that I'll need to demonstrate today and to make more economical use of my time. Let me just point out that this wide disparity between the views of many who support the sustainability and some of the facts that we have on hand uh, is a distressing part of this phenomena. Let me begin with Naomi Klein, the author of This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate. Uh, faced with a crisis that threatens our survival as a species, she writes, our entire culture is continuing to do the very thing that caused the crisis, only with an extra dose of elbow grease behind it. The global economy is upping the ante from conventional sources of fossil fuels to even dirtier and more dangerous versions, bitumen from Alberta tar sands, oil from the deep water drilling, gas from hydraulic fracturing, coal from detonated mountains, and so on. Um, now this destruction of the planet narrative of which Naomi Klein is one of many thousands who could be cited, uh, runs into some problems. Uh, I am the owner of a house in rural Vermont. Uh, I can go out into the forest behind my house and walk for as many miles as I might choose, encountering along the way stone wall after stone wall, cellar holes where houses used to be, um, and yet I'm walking through deep forest. Um, what I'm experiencing there is something that pretty much anybody in North America can experience outside our cities, which is the reforestation of our continent, which now has more trees than it had during colonial times. Um, this is not simply something limited to uh, the United States or Canada. Uh, between 1960 and 2000, India added 15 million hectares of forest, that is, for uh, sake of comparison, about the size of Iowa to overcrowded India is now forested. Um, this uh, rise of reforestation is something that is fairly widely noted. In 2006, the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences reported that of 50 nations with extensive forests, no nation with an annual per capita gross domestic product exceeding $4,600 had a negative rate in forest growth. Um, we are, uh, apart from the single nation of Brazil, a world that is growing forest rapidly. Uh, as it happens, even in Brazil and other areas of tropical rainforest, a quarter of the tropical rainforest is now regenerating, according to the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute's report in 2009. Now, uh, it's not my intention to go into a, a kind of uh, he said, she said version of what's going on with uh, the world's natural resources. But these important factual disputes, I believe, flow partly from the indeterminacy built into the original definition of sustainability, which left it vague to the point of impossible to tell uh, what would be the standards of deciding how we were meeting present needs without compromising future needs. Um, but there are other causes to this uh, uh, problem of factual disputes. There's the confirmation bias that we encounter among those who are arguing that we are indeed in the midst of some existential uh, environmental crisis. 
There is the suspect character of much of contemporary science founded on modeling. There's the sheer complexity of the phenomena to be studied. We don't really know how to model uh, in any effective way the Earth's atmosphere and weather systems. There's the rise of postmodern inquiry and the kinds of pseudoscience that go with it. There is the newly launched precautionary principle with its radical uh, devaluation of evidence. It doesn't matter how little the threat might be. If there's any threat at all, we must uh, take heed and act immediately to end it. There is what I will go on to describe as a kind of climate hysteria and climate thuggery. Now, um, I can't use those last two words without giving some context for them. Uh, in September, Jagdish Shukla, a professor at George Mason University, and 19 other fairly prominent scientists wrote to President Obama asking him to instruct the Justice Department to use the Racketeering Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act to go after so-called climate deniers basically find them criminally responsible for spreading propaganda that is hurting uh, the cause of uh, climate alarmism. Uh, the letter was posted publicly for a while, but after an outcry, it was taken down. Uh, no evidence yet that President Obama wants to act on that, but uh, Senator Whitehouse from uh, Rhode Island has uh, made public statements supporting the use of RICO statute to go after climate <coughs> skeptics. And uh, just this week, the Attorney General of New York State has uh, begun proceedings against ExxonMobil on the grounds that he believes that back in the day, ExxonMobil knew that uh, the use of fossil fuels would cause a climate disaster and has covered up that information, and therefore the company is criminally involved. Um, the Shukla case has attracted attention in another way, which I'll touch, touch on briefly. He, he and his family and his institute at George Mason have drawn something on the order of $70 million in the last 15 years from the National Science Foundation for their work. Sukla himself and his wife have benefited uh, to the degree of a, uh, a salary over and above what they get from George Mason of $530,000 uh, as of 2004 and growing. Um, so one might say that there is a uh, suspicion of motives here of a man who wants to shut down debate when the debate in question uh, might be harmful to his own interests. Um, when I talk about uh, the climate hysteria and climate thuggery, I'm also thinking of the president of Greenpeace, Aaron Mayer, in his recent uh, performance before the U.S. Senate, where he was questioned on what has often been called the uh, climate pause, the fact that for the last 18 or more years, according to satellite data, there has been no measurable global warming. Um, this fact is now disputed, as you may know, by NOAA, which claims that readjusted surface temperature readings for that period show that global warming has continued. Uh, so there's a scientific dispute. Uh, Aaron Mayer, head of a very important environmental organization, however, upon uh, being asked to testify about this, gave a very odd performance. Some of you may have seen the video of it. Uh, he says no less than 15 times in rapid succession uh, versions of I concur with the 97% of the world scientists. Uh, I'm in agreement with the 97% consensus. We concur with the 97% of scientists. 97% seemed to be basically the only words he had available to deal with uh, a question about the pause. On the pause itself, he misdefined it as something that uh, had uh, occurred back in the 1940s. He was completely unacquainted with the language that we might call that of global warming skeptics. Um, something is amiss here when major proponents of a theory have no idea what the other side is saying. And while we're on the subject of that 97%, it probably bears mention that the figure has been repeatedly discredited. Uh, it derives from studies of tiny 
pre-selected samples of uh, so-called climate scientists with the exclusion of those who dissent from it. Uh, I could go into that question in more detail, but I will forego it for the moment. 97% um, probably could be translated to a majority of people who earn their living as climate scientists and derive their income from grants related to thereof uphold the theory. And in that, it's almost tautological. One would not expect anything else. Um, all right, so how did we get to this, this mass movement that uh, could have been just a throwaway line in yet another UN report from uh, 30 years ago, almost? Uh, well, the history here is, as histories go, fairly long and complex. I'm going to give a, a quick timeline of it just so that we have something, a base to work from. The American fascination with the wilderness, of course, goes back a very long time, um, Audubon, Thoreau, and so on. We begin to get something like the recent history around 1948, which was the year Fairfield Osborne published Our Plundered Planet and William Volk, The Road to Survival. Both could be called neo-Malthusian pictures of population growth, which is going to outstrip our ability to feed the planet. Uh, in 1962 is a really benchmark year. That's Rachel Carson's Silent Spring gets published and alarms the American public about the threat from pesticides and industrial chemicals in the environment. Less noted, but the same year, actually preceding uh, Carson by a few months, was Murray Bookchin's Road to Survival. I'm sorry, uh, Our Synthetic Environment. Uh, Bookchin was a ex-Stalinist who had become an anarchist and then broke with the anarchists because they were too organized. And, uh, but he has a, a sort of interesting role in this in that he's the, uh, the first man of the left to realize that the uh, threat of pollution could be used to uh, drive a, uh, a wedge against capitalism. And our synthetic environment is about how uh, the productions of plastics and other chemicals are uh, going to kill off Americans. Um, Bookchin went on shortly after that to invent a phrase that has survived him in popular usage, social ecology is a Bookchinism. Um, 1964, the Wilderness Act. Uh, 1968, Paul Ehrlich's famous The Population Bomb, predicting basically uh, mass starvation and near extinction by the end of the century, if not sooner. 1969, the UN Fund for Population Activities is created. Nixon signs the National Environmental and Policy Act. The Clean Air Act, 1970, the same year the EPA is founded as part of that. Um, the first school of social ecology, Bookchin's legacy, founded at UC Irvine in 1970, and of course it was the first Earth Day. Um, Barry Commoner publishes The Closing Circle in 1971. That includes the three laws of ecology, of which the first and most important is everything is related to everything else. Uh, that uh, seemingly uh, kind of cryptic phrase has really become a, a key concept for the sustainability movement. 1972 is the Club of Rome's limits to growth, like Ehrlich predicting overpopulation will lead to uh, huge catastrophes. But 1972 is the Clean Water Act, 1973 is the Endangered Species Act, and 1976 is the launch of the first climate change catastrophe theory. It was titled the Cooling, Has the Next Ice Age Already Begun? by Lowell Ponte. Uh, the Cooling made the cover of uh, Time magazine, and for a period of about 10 years, it was the great threat of climate change, the new ice age. 79, Three Mile Island. Uh, in 1979, also, there was a, a research group at MIT that issued what was called the Cherney Report, which is the first ever modern mention of the threat of global warming. Um, the Cherney Report did not make headlines or the cover of Time magazine. 
1983, the UN created the Brundtland Commission that I've already mentioned. In 1984 was the World Population Conference in Mexico City, which declared population control a matter of urgency. Now, um, this uh, march through the years is quickly going to come to an end here. Uh, the Brundtland Commission report, as I mentioned, was in 1987. That was the same year that Edward uh, Barber produced the sustainability movement's uh, key symbol. It's three overlapping circles, a Venn diagram, and the circles are usually labeled the environment, the economy, and social justice. It's where they overlap that you can have a sustainable society. Uh, that threesome sometimes gets uh, translated into people walking around with three fingers up. Uh, that's to remind us that the sustainability movement is not just about the environment. And it's at that point, I think, that we can begin to draw an important distinction between the environmental movement as a whole and the sustainability movement, which is something different, although sustainability sounds to a lot of people as though it's just environmentalism ramped up. I think that that's a misreading of what it really is. Um, 1988, that's the year after the Brundtland Commission report, NASA scientist James Hansen testifies to Congress on a very hot June day in a room with the air conditioners turned off and the windows open to let the sultry DC air into the room. We know those were staged events because the senator who staged them uh, later talked about it. Uh, Hansen testifies to Congress that global warming is real, it's here, and it's now. Uh, get the order of these two events. The sustainability movement was launched before the idea of global warming was, but it didn't take very long for the two to find each other. Uh, later that year, uh, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, meeting in Toronto, endorsed the idea that global warming was a threat and that sustainability was the solution. Uh, Margaret Thatcher was doing so in order to beat up on the coal miners in England, who she wanted to disempower. I'm not quite clear why Ronald Reagan thought it was such a good idea, uh, but their efforts helped launch the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which is now uh, a mischief maker of global proportions. 1989 saw the publication of the young Bill McKibben's first work, The End of Nature. Uh, Bill McKibben is by far the leading figure in the sustainability movement worldwide. 1992, Al Gore's Earth in the Balance was published. 92 was the ozone layer being discovered, and 93 saw the founding of a group called Second Nature, about which I will have a little bit more to say. Um, that's the sort of rundown on a very you know, skimmed timeline of how we got to this movement. Uh, let me interpret it a little bit. Um, Americans have long had an, a conservation ethic, not shared by all Americans, for sure. Some were happy to rape resources from the environment and so on. But generally speaking, there was, uh, from well in early in the 19th century, some public movement to want to keep what we had as far as uh, the nation's natural resources were and not let them be entirely squandered. Um, the moment in 1962 when Rachel Carson published Silent Spring and Bookchin published his uh, tirade, we begin to get something else which has to do with fighting pollution, keeping bad things out of our environment, getting clean air and clean water. And the environmental movement of the 60s and 70s was focused almost entirely on that. So what did we do? We cleaned up our air and water. Uh, the EPA's initial efforts were highly successful, and communities across the country, dirty cities like the one I grew up in Pittsburgh, became clean cities. Uh, so that was the environmental movement. But no movement likes to uh, achieve its goals and quit. So something more had to come along. Um, the first of those things, I would say, the Brundtland Commission's main idea was to reformulate social and economic order. It wasn't simply enough to clean up the environment. There were 
diffuse threats of an unspecified nature, some of them having to do with overpopulation, some of them with resource use that had to be cleaned up. And this would require, uh, among other things, using more direct language than Brentland herself used, but essentially the dismantling of capitalism and the supplementing, if not replacing, of democratic self-government with some sort of international regulatory regime. That's what the Brundtland Commission report called for. Now, the Brundtland Commission report didn't sit all that well with environmentalists. Uh, for one thing, it was pro-development. It was calling for sustainable development, but it was still calling for development. And it harbored a theory that the uh, squ the square could be circled, that somehow we could have both. This. Um, caused some consternation. Now, it's interesting that if you look at this movement around the world now, the sustainability movement in Europe and most other places is still called sustainable development. That's a term that's only used by specialized bureaucrats in the U.S., where it's been replaced with the word sustainability, and the development part of it has just uh, migrated away. The issue became, or became so closely entwined with that most people now have a difficult time drawing the distinction of fighting global warming. So the sustainability movement with its uh, desire for reordering the economy and the social order became also a matter of fighting global warming or climate change. And this has led to this movement now that draws probably most of its emotional and moral energy from the idea that the nation faces a, uh, or the nation, the world faces a catastrophe uh, unknown since perhaps early Paleolithic times. Um, now, given that this is a uh, seminar on political theory, and I'm not much of a theorist, I'm an ethnographer, uh, I'm going to shift to offering a set of conclusions or theses about this movement. Uh, I will say in advance that some of these are inconsistent with each other, but they're all true. <laughs> <laughs> the first is the environmental movement and the sustainability movement differ in important ways. I've already said that. To understand sustainability, we have to draw this distinction and realize that it's not really about the environment, not really about the environment at all. The environment is its stalking horse. Second, numerous observers have linked sustainability to religion. I've done that. The title of the report I issued earlier this year is Sustainability, Higher Education's New Fundamentalism. Um, but I claim no originality for that. It has been uh, a theme well mined by people on both sides of the Atlantic. The, uh, French social theorist Pascal Bruckner has uh, written books in which he declares that uh, sustainability is a religion. Is it like a religion? Is it a religion? That's a debatable point. But if it is accurate, what other religions does sustainability most resemble? Is it like Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Paganism, Christianity? I think that debate comes down to two options. Sustainability is either a form of paganism in deifying the earth, and there is a case that many of the followers of this movement do deify the earth, or sustainability is some kind of uh, uh, Christianity without Jesus. It's a mythology that involves a fall from Eden, a struggle with sin, environmental sin, the emergence of a faithful remnant, a, a coming end times or apocalypse, a prescribed aesthetic regimen for the followers, forms of penance that either can be taken up voluntarily or imposed on others, and a salvation narrative. So it's a lot like Christianity in its forms. Um, now, how literal are these analogies? Um, I'd say that the sorts of things I was describing are just as literal for followers of sustainability as they are for most followers of Christianity. They're parallel doctrines in the Christian churches. That certainly has been underscored by uh, 
Pope Francis's uh, recent encyclical on this. Third point, religion is not the only lens through which we can see this movement. Another is ideology. Um, now, for some, of course, religion and ideology are virtual synonyms, but I'll take it as useful to distinguish religion as setting out a, a master narrative of the knowable universe and ideology as something more limited and contextual in the form of groups of self-validating beliefs. Marxism, for example, tries to explain a lot, but it doesn't try to explain everything. Likewise, psychoanalysis. Sustainability is an ideology that's constructed of several parts. Uh, that uh, first rule from Barry Commoner of everything is connected to everything else, so you can't treat anything in isolation. The second is scarcity, the Malthusian principle that's woven into it. Third is the idea of a natural order, which has been somehow violated. And the fourth is that it's a very time conscious. It's a movement that is about time, intergenerational time especially. Fourth thesis, um, sustainability is not science. It likes to borrow the authority of science. It uses words like climate science. It has uh, dubbed our current period the Anthropocene, as though we've entered into a whole new geological epoch and it has looked for uh, signifiers of that. But these are verbal constructs that have uh, one thing that science uh, never has, which is non-falsifiability. The Popperian uh, standard here is completely violated. These are claims made that look only for validation of themselves, and therefore uh, this movement, despite its attempts to uh, address itself as science, is not that. Sustainability is incompatible, fifth thesis, with liberal democracy. Now, not all of its proponents believe this, but many of them do. And confronted with a choice between retaining political freedom and pursuing sustainatopia, they emphatically choose the latter. Uh, these would-be autocrats better understand the logic of their movement, I think, than those who temporize and think that we can have both elected representative government and sustainability. Whence the, uh, the friction between the two? Well, uh, uh, Thomas Friedman, the columnist in the uh, New York Times, has repeatedly called for America to be China for a day, or at least he wishes that it were. Um, why? Because we can't solve these problems with all the encumbrances of elected government and representative democracy. Too many people have too much of a stake in private property and keeping things the way they are and avoiding the really hard decisions that must be made in order to guarantee the future. Now, Friedman is a moderate in this. There are some uh, people in the sustainability movement who uh, outwardly and uh, robustly emulate the uh, more totalitarian approach to things. Um, Harvard's own Naomi Oreskes, her the collapse of Western civilization, that's not a threat, that's a promise. Uh, this is a, a little book that it pretends to be in the future looking back and is sort of gleeful with the destruction of uh, places like the United States and the rise the contrary of uh, the collapse of Western civilization. And the places that do best when climate catastrophe overtakes the world are China. That's it. So um, I take it that uh, the, while this theme is somewhat submerged within the movement, the deeper you get into it, the more you find that this is a, uh, a set of postulates that run against the idea of free people governing their own lives. Now, Sixth, sustainability is for a substantial number of its champions a movement that will help bring about the final destruction of capitalism. So even apart from the governmental issues, they believe that uh, the exploitation of natural resources as per the inner logic of capitalism is itself bad and that what we need is a form of uh, an economic system that militates against that. Now, what that economic system would be is sometimes hard to say. Uh, people like the other Naomi, Naomi Klein, um, uh, call for socialism as the alternative, but uh, Bill McKibben, 
I guess you'd have to call him a kind of primitivist. He would like to see a 90% reduction in the world's population, uh, followed by a return to subsistence living on the basis of small farms and hunting and gathering. Uh, so what kind of economic system is that? I guess it's Swinton agriculture or something like, like that. But in any case, it's not capitalism. Uh, seventh. Sustainability owes some intellectual debts to Marxism, uh, not just in its rejection of capitalism, but in its thoroughgoing materialism, its opposition to the idea of exploitation in any form, and its borrowing of the idea of oppressed classes. Um, it is unlike Marxism in its rejection of material progress, industrialization, and its idealization of poverty. Uh, the sustainability movement thinks poverty is just fine. Um, the, uh, by the way, the, the standard of living now promoted by the uh, UN on this would have us at uh, living at the level of a Haitian economy right now. They want to have uh, the per capita use of carbon-based resources at no higher than what Haiti has. And the US uh, is about roughly 100 times what Haiti is right now. So you can look forward to a very abstemious lifestyle in the next few years. Um, sustainability is socially located, my eighth thesis, as victimhood for privileged white kids. Uh, it is not a movement you will find many minorities are part of, although it makes strenuous efforts to co-op minorities. So uh, you will find the sustainability movement has great things to say about the need to overcome <laughs> racial oppression, sexual oppression, and so on. But you won't find many people in the Black Lives Matter movement saying, yes, we need sustainability. It's an asymmetrical relationship. Sustainability people want the credibility of victimhood par excellence, not getting very much of it, they've developed their own. Who could be a greater victim than this current generation of students who are growing up in a world in which they see their elders having uh, gone profitably through the world's resources while leaving behind a, a cinder for them on which to starve? Uh, this, uh, this notion of their own victimhood is morally self-empowering. The way to be self-empowered today is to be a victim, and the way to become a victim if nobody's actually oppressing you is to conjure up a form of oppression that is so global and so cosmic that uh, you can barely understand it until your eyes have been opened. It's more of that religious revelation theme. Now, ninth, sustainability is the ideological tool of the crony capitalist green energy establishment. I'd say. Its usefulness to this special interest is that it helps drive up the cost of carbon-based fuels and reduces or eliminates their price advantages so that uh, uneconomic forms of energy production like solar and wind uh, are suddenly within shouting distance of being able to compete on price. That's not going to happen unless Bill McKibben has his way. He wants four-fifths of the world's fossil fuel reserves left underground forever. Um, if he gets his way, then probably it will be cheaper to uh, uh, provide our energy uses through uh, uh, solar energy. Um, I should add here, I have nothing against solar energy or wind energy per se. Uh, or uh, fusion energy if we ever get it, or building uh, old-style nuclear plants. Uh, I'm not in bed with the fossil fuel industry. I think we should get energy wherever we can, but we should probably get it as cheap as we can. Um, tenth, sustainability has gained the advantages that come from uh, institutionalized government favor, and the main advantage that gains from that is the creation of a courtier class that spends its time extolling, justifying, reinforcing the legitimacy of the project and denouncing its opponents. It's helpful that a substantial segment of this new courtier class consists of scientists who claim the special authority of objective knowledge makers but we should keep in count that their uh, income and their research derives solely from uh, government favor, or almost solely. Um, Eleventh thesis, sustainability corrupts science. I'll leave it at that. Uh, Twelfth, among the freedoms that sustainability regards as intolerable 
is intellectual freedom and also freedom of speech. This is a movement that has gone to elaborate lengths to prevent uh, conversation or disagreement. Uh, it's not simply using RICO statutes, theoretically, to go after people, but it is the shutting down of debate on campus. This event, this room we're in right now, what we're talking about, uh, is a very rare thing in American higher education. Uh, I've been working on this topic, among others, since 2008. Uh, during that time, I have written or called hundreds of colleges and universities in this country offering to pay for a debate on campus. A few of them have agreed only weeks later to get back in touch with me to say, sorry, we can't find anybody willing to talk to you on the other side. Uh, I wasn't necessarily insisting that I be the spokesman for this. I was willing to pay for uh, the combatants of their choice. But this is not a discussable topic. Uh, it has been stigmatized as denialism on the basis of uh, uh, an alleged uh, similarity with Holocaust denialism. Uh, more recently, it's been attacked as uh, uh, like unto the tobacco industry's efforts to promote doubts on the uh, uh, dangers of cigarette smoking. So uh, wherever we go on this, the, the conversation itself has been polluted by the idea that allowing or permitting people to speak forcefully on the other side of the issue or any other side of the issue is unendurable. Of course, we're seeing other versions of this uh, clamping down on free speech in many other contexts of higher education. It's a close question as to whether the, the mood of hostility to uh, free speech is driven initially by the sustainability movement and then adopted by Black Lives Matter and so on, or it, they're just happening to find the same conceptual space at the same time, but there we are. Um, sustainability is a doctrine, this is my 13th thesis, for the perpetual impoverishment of humanity. That is, uh, this is the Arthur Brooks thesis, that if you strip the cheaper fossil fuels away from the third world, you're leaving the third world with what? Um, basically nothing. And um, the thought that we're somehow going to use solar power to help people living in the Kalahari uh, is rather ludicrous. Sustainability claims moral authority and moral urgency, but it is rooted in illusions and deceptions. Um, that's a topic on which I uh, could spend quite a lot of time. The report on sustainability and the report on the divestment movement go into uh, considerable detail about the degree to which the movement has been willing to indulge in deceptions. Uh, one of the key deceptions is the degree of its own support among people, but we'll leave it at that at the moment. And finally, and then I'll open to discussion, Sustainability is a cult founded on desperation. It's as if Thoreau's uh, remark that men live lives of quiet desperation has been taken hold of by the believers of the movement who think that the answer is that we should be leading lives of noisy desperation. Thank you. Well, questions? I guess the first thing that comes to mind after this rather apocalyptic description of what's going on is what would you recommend those of us not caught up in the religion or the fantasy or the movement, what would you recommend we do? If you are uh, part of a university, I would recommend that you insist on uh, open debate about these issues, uh, and uh, there has been a, uh, a clamping down that prevents people like me speaking on campus. That just shouldn't be. Uh, but uh, beyond that, there is the live issue right now of uh, divestment from fossil fuels. Uh, again, I don't particularly take a position on whether it's uh, to the financial advantage or disadvantage of a college to divest from fossil fuels, but I think both sides of the debate should be heard, and the, the bullying of people, uh, silencing, crowding out of the room, various techniques uh, should not be tolerated by any academic community. Um, uh, beyond that, I have the, the kind of uh, 
recommendations that would make of on any issue like this, which is if it's important enough for you to be here listening to me today, it's important enough that you should inform yourself about what the debates are. Uh, only so much can be communicated in a few minutes like this. It's a, a, a pretty broad topic. It has its own large literature, but find your way to it, perhaps through our reports, or maybe you start by reading Naomi Klein or something like that. I, I think uh, getting acquainted with the uh, works of Bill McKibben is a really good idea. There probably is no academic in the United States more influential over the current generation than Bill McKibben. Uh, yet, I don't believe he's very widely read by uh, grown-ups. He is a, a man who uh, is an extraordinarily good writer. He began his career as the uh, writer of the uh, New Yorker's Talk of the Town before he became a radical environmentalist. Uh, his words are powerful. He is a, uh, uh, a purebred demagogue when he speaks. He's full of fire and he turns his audiences alive. You ought to know who he is and you ought to, knowing his works, then think about whether you agree with him. Uh, <coughs> we don't need that in Boston. The Boston Globe loves Bill McKibben and prints his stuff on the op-eds. So we have a surfeit, you might say, here. My question is, does the overall picture you've presented am amount to a, a dystopia? Historically, the left was optimistic and uh, <coughs> Marx in included. There were outliers, anti-industrial people, William Morris, Robert Owen for a while, but they were overwhelmed by the so-called scientific socialism. And in my present work about left-wing and right-wing in China policy, going back to FDR, I find that the depression and the apparent success of the Soviet Union in the 30s made people more welcoming to Mao and, and gave revolution a kind of glow with all sorts of meanings that, that didn't cohere. Uh, but the, the people involved wanted to repair capitalism with social democracy. And the, the real break in this story of left and right on China policy is the Vietnam War, because in the Vietnam War, the young, uh, loud activists felt the US was unworthy to do this or that in Asia. This was an entirely new note which hadn't uh, been evident in the FDR period, and it would seem that Mr. Mr. Obama is is under the influence of this conclusion. And <coughs> it, your story was full of uh, an attachment to pessimism. The environmental movement has a success, but then they they don't stop. They they find more problems. The. Um it is a very broad movement with many strands of uh, emotional configuration in it as, as well as different policy prescriptions. Uh, what I find among the students is uh, a kind of uh, wishfulness about this awful apocalypse that is about to come. They say we want to stop it, but at the same time they fantasize about it all the time and what their lives are going to be like as they imagine themselves to be among the remnant survivors. Um, it is a, a species of um, public fantasy that I think we probably see reflected in the fascination with zombies, for example. It's, uh, there is this notion that uh, the world is coming to come to an end. How am I going to handle that? And that's exciting. It, it means that uh, you're living at the crucial moment in the Earth's history when the most important event since the extinction of the dinosaurs is going to occur. And just how lucky is that? You're, uh, things uh, seldom get more dramatic. Uh, is it pessimistic? It's pessimistic about all the things that make up uh, a civilization that's worth 
preserving and fighting for, but they're ready to let it go. Goodbye civilization. Uh, hello subsistence living. Now, would they really want that were they to be confronted with it as a actual choice? Uh, very few, I suppose. Uh, but as realm for fantasy, it's very, very powerful. Uh, I found your um, presentation depressingly convincing, and uh, I knew uh, some of that stuff just from reading the Wall Street Journal editorial page over the years, but a good deal was new to me. Um, one of the things that seems to be going on is a redefinition of what capitalism is. Uh, Marx has a very precise definition about the ownership of the means of production, and <clears throat> which is... <clears throat> Uh, and it also has cultural ramifications, but it's a fairly precise definition. And, and you're telling it seems to me that capitalism is wealth, or is just prosperity, what we would call uh, prosperity. Uh, and then th it came into my mind that maybe this, just to push back slightly, that this the success of this movement is a kind of dying gasp in a way of opposition to capitalism, since the big socioeconomic fact of the last 30 years is the vast increase of wealth in China and India, and even starting now in Africa, uh, the world's getting richer. Yeah. And the world likes getting richer uh, for the most part. Uh, and the world getting richer, of course, also destroys the Leninist interpretation of, of, of capitalism. Uh, since we're not opening the veins of Latin America anymore, and we're not stealing from <coughs> poor nations, the poor nations are now getting rich. Um, that's not the, the explanation for the riches of the West is not theft from the poor nations. It can't be anymore. It was always an unconvincing argument if you got down to actual numbers, but <coughs> it had a kind of global plausibility. You could tell people in undergraduates that you know America was rich because India was poor. So um, what I'm saying is I wonder if we are, I would love to believe uh, that this is um, a kind of paroxysm of failure in, in the anti-capitalist uh, movements. And it's very visible to us because we're in the academy and that's the academy is the stronghold of, of the left. But I'm wondering uh, how much and we, uh, if you go to other parts of the world, if you go to middle America, if you go to um, places beyond the influence of the New York Times editorial page, whether they're really losing. Well, I have no sure way of, of uh, answering that. Uh, I would not want to underestimate the uh, power of this movement insofar as that represents uh, the political platform of the Democratic Party, for example. Uh, President Obama's headed off to Paris now to uh, do what he did with the Iran Treaty to essentially uh, declare that uh, this is a treaty is not a treaty. Um, the uh, resources that flow from the federal science establishment, not just the uh, National Science Foundation, but are uh, in the billions. They support, as I said, a courtier class that does basically nonstop propaganda in favor of the movement. Um, that reaches the uh, people who never see the editorial page of the New York Times in middle America. It certainly reaches middle America in that we're not going to have the Keystone Pipeline anytime soon. There are real world effects of this movement. New York State does not uh, permit fracking. Um, that's a real world conclusion that drives directly from this. There's no reason in the world why we should not have fracking everywhere we can get it. It's a clean energy source. It has, as far as anyone can tell, zero environmental impact of any magnitude. They try to look for earthquakes or something that might flow from it, but nothing does. And we end up with driving down the price of, uh, of fuel. Um, 
So uh, why not frack? Well, the why not frack is that somehow we're you're taking carbon out of the earth, we're putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we're heating up the earth past 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide, and that's going to kill us all. Well, um, if you believe that story, that it's going to kill us all, then stop fracking and all the rest of it. But the question here is who's winning the war for public opinion? And um, I see precious little pushback on the part of anyone in higher education, uh, groups like mine that have uh, uh, made some push on this at all are a tiny, virtually insignificant sliver of the spectrum of public opinion in the country. Um, I'm sure my reports will not be noticed or mentioned in any way by the New York Times. Um, uh, broadcast television or uh, cable television will never take note of them. Um, we are saturated in a monolithic uh, opinion environment, and that has to have consequences. This is this the last gasp of successful capitalism? Well, I think China is laughing about this. They've been increasing their coal production. They will say anything at all to make Obama happy about how they're going to cut fossil fuel production. India is having nothing of it. They want to develop uh, the uh, sub-Saharan African countries and other parts of nations and other parts of the world uh, see the, the great pinata of wealth that they can extract from um, the uh, developed nations by means of green mail. So the what the Paris uh, Treaty and about, is about, as well as other things, is trying to get the, uh, the developed world to hand over giant amounts of money to the third world in order to remediate a non-existent threat. Um, if I could be Marxist for a second, maybe success with capitalism happens in the base and the socialists are confined in the superstructure. Because as you know, we have fracking in this country, all over the country, mm -hmm. and the states that haven't, haven't accepted are getting poorer, having more and more budget problems. The states that do accept it are, uh, are um, much richer, and people are moving across the border. The, the, in, in a, in, in a, I'm thinking long term, obviously, but things could look very different 20 years from now. No. When the I people of upstate sitting... New York move to North Dakota, I'll believe you. <laughs> But the underlying concept is we don't deserve to thrive. And if, if that's an underlying concept, the movement's not going to end. It will just find more uh, causes for pessimism. We deserve to suffer. But we deserve to survive. I mean, or to be sustained. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what strikes me. Yeah. That's what strikes me about uh, this uh, movement, that it's uh, it's anti-science in the sense that it's much more pro-human than science in its purer forms allows itself to be. But science says that there's no special creation, there's no hierarchy of, of species. We're not at the top. Uh, we should, if we are, we should spend our time worrying about endangered species. But now we're, uh, congratulating ourselves on on being the uh, the most endangered species and therefore the most deserving of our attention isn't that just a kind of continuance of the notion that it's uh, the, the, that human beings have a right to exploit nature and also I mean sustainability doesn't seem quite right because uh, the the, the laws of science will go on whether or not they're human beings. So, nature will be sustained. It doesn't care about us, so far as we can tell. When life on this planet comes to an end, as it will sooner or later necessarily, and uh, who knows whether there's uh, sort of, uh, some other humanity or uh, similar humanity elsewhere, it doesn't, we don't have any notice of it. And it, it, it seems as if human uh, wisdom and science itself could be wiped out, and and, and, uh, and nature would be perfectly well sustained. Uh, typically, they don't use sustainability in that uh, <laughs> antiseptic sense, <laughs> um, but uh, it would be hard to 
build a mass movement, I think, on a, a call for human extinction or an indifference to human fate. There are, however, people within the movement who profess precisely that. They would be willing to save the earth if the cost were to uh, eradicate humanity, that, uh, which is sometimes spoken of as a virus that needs to be killed. Well, I interrupted. Shep had a question. Uh, what you say about limits on debate, I think, is very disturbing, especially this new move by the Attorney General of New York um, to, to use a state statute basically to silence corporate speech. But I just want the <coughs> It, it strikes me that part of the, the, some of the fault for the limits on debate um, come from Republicans and critics of global warming in the sense that they've really made the battle over, we don't believe there's any evidence that global warming is happening and it has a human cause. As I read the evidence, it, it, you know, we can't be certain, but there's pretty good evidence that, that, that the Earth is warming and it's a human cause. But the really big question, is, well, what do we do about it? What's the dose-response relationship? If we, and some people have argued, John Lomborg has argued that if we really cut back um, carbon uh, emissions, it really wouldn't have much, not gonna have much effect. Um, and the new claim on, by environmentalists and sustainability people is that there's a tipping point to work. It strikes me that the scientific basis for that is really small. So if the debate is really about it is, it is about whether there's evidence that it's happening. Mm -hmm. That's not a very good place to, to help to stage the debate. It's, okay, what can we do? How serious is this? Is it better to have mitigation than, than prevention? Those more complicated issues. Well, I, I agree that those are separate issues. Um, there's only a handful of senators who have been uh, making noises about there being no global warming at all, like Senator Imhoff, um, although I regard that as an open debate. We have had this 18-year-plus pause, and uh, that, that opens the question of really what is happening to uh, uh, our atmosphere. Uh, and there's also the very strong geologic evidence, most people here probably have some idea of it, of, uh, wild fluctuations in the amount of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and global temperatures over eons. Uh, you don't even have to take eons over thousands of years, even over hundreds of years. There have been significant variations, all of which preceded the use of fossil fuels in any significant degree. So the question of uh, whether the increase from um, 300 to 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere bodes catastrophe, in my mind, is an open question and ought to be debated. But I'm also happy to see the debate that says, okay, we'll assume the answer to that is that carbon dioxide has reached a critical point that is causing global warming. We just haven't tracked it down yet. Um, then what do we do about it? The um, the debate there is also stifled. Uh, there's um, some debate over whether we should have cap and trade or, or solutions like that. Lundberg, who you mentioned, interestingly, was offered a uh, academic appointment at the University of Western Australia, and in response to one of these don't let the skeptics on my campus approach, his appointment was rescinded after a vigorous student protest. Uh, What's really interesting about that is that Lomborg believes in global warming. He's a fairly strong advocate for the anthropogenic global warming hypothesis. He just doesn't believe that shutting down the fossil fuel industry will be the answer. Um, most of the people who work in the field who favor uh, uh, some kind of remedial action against global warming uh, freely admit that the amount of temperature decrease that can be caused by radical reductions in uh, U.S. carbon emissions is almost infinitesimally small. So we couldn't bankrupt ourselves, but we're not going to change the path of the climate. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have, well, first of all, self-disclosure, I have uh, been involved uh, the last few years, a little bit in connection with financing of, uh, uh, of renewable energy, so um, so I may fall into this 
courtier class that you, uh, <laughs> that you have uh, referred to. But it, but it seems to me that what you have described <coughs> uh, is what I would call the theoretical or ideological sustainability people. And there's certainly, in, in the, you know, the ones that I have run into the last few years really don't fall into that category. I guess I would call them the pragmatic uh, sustainability. And, and it seems to me that what they are focused on are a few things. First of all, if Thomas Friedman has mentioned, we just had the discussion as to whether or not uh, there is global warming and whether it's caused by humans. And I, I remember at one point Friedman said, well, if you deny it, what if you're wrong? You know, what are the consequences, uh, you know, the consequences of that? And I, and I think that a lot of people I run into that that's is, it certainly describes my own uh, view is something, you know, it doesn't lead to anything apocalyptic, but you do have to be concerned that, well, if you ignore this or you, you, you deny it, and if you're wrong, then there could be some severe consequences. And I think that's the first thing that I thought. Second is, I, from time to time, you know, in terms of the push for renewables or sustainability, you get the national security uh, argument that it's, uh, yeah, now that's a little less with, with, uh, with the result of fracking, but still, you know, I have run into people in this, uh, you know, involved in this business who are conservative Republicans, and they cite the national security. That's why we're, we're uh, doing this. I think a third thing which comes up is that, uh, and again, this gets to your point on terms of you know you're well fine with solar and wind, but you know is it you know does it economically compete? And people talk a lot about the economics of fossil fuel as to whether the market really reflects the health costs, uh, the pollution, the government uh, efforts for pollution, and so forth, which it really doesn't. So is that an appropriate method for the government to? Uh, to provide some type of subsidy to wind and solar to uh, even uh, to make it a closer uh, uh, in terms of competition. And, and by the way, in, in both of these are getting close, I think, to being parity with uh, fossil fuel, not necessarily the reduced price of the current environment, but what has been the, the normalized over the last 20 or 25 years. And then the final is that there's a lot of discussion about, again, in terms of parity, the tremendous subsidies that have been given to uh, fossil fuels, really beginning back uh, from the beginning. Some of it is obvious, such as the, you know, the depletion allowance and so forth in the tax code. Others are a little more subtle, the building of the interstate highway uh, system. They, there are certain types of investment vehicles that fossil fuels uh, can use that renewables cannot. So, so I think it's a little more com you know, complex than that. But anyway, these are the types of things that people that I deal with, and not this you know, theoretical, you know, what, you know, we're, we're going to be reduced back to the, you know, the Stone Age or the Iron Age in terms of our, of our uh, way of living and, and so forth. Well, that's helpful. Um, let me respond to all four. Uh, the first that you mentioned is the version of the, the precautionary principle that I, that I did allude to. Uh, if uh, there is any chance at all that this might be a uh, real threat, we shouldn't uh, take that chance. Well, the same thing, of course, could be said about witches. We have very little evidence that malevolent witches are amongst us, but there is a chance that there may be a malevolent witch, so shouldn't we go out and hang all the witches? Uh, it would be a huge social cost. Yeah, well, I'm not certain about that analogy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, one might. Sorry? It's Pascal's wager. Right. It is a version of Pascal's wager. And the, I mean, I think that a rational answer to it is that there has to be a threshold of danger. Uh, it can't be just any danger. Uh, there are certainly dangers that we know about, such as being struck by a large asteroid. Um, should we currently spend what it would take to build an armada of uh, interstellar or interplanetary missiles to take out dangerous asteroids. There are some people who think so, but if we ramped up a, a national or international hysteria about this, I suppose we'd go on a crash program of asteroid shields. Um, I don't know what the degree of likelihood of uh, there being actual global warming 
as the kind of threat that we're talking about this is. But what I do know is that uh, I have slowly found myself drawn into distrust of the scientific pronouncements that the danger is real. Why do I have that distrust? I don't know, I'm trained as a scientist myself. Uh, I have simply found that uh, uh, the takeover of uh, the American Association for Advancement of Science and the magazine Science. Almost every week now, science is front to back a report about discoveries of new ways in which uh, global warming is insidiously working its way into the food chain, into the oceans, and so forth. It's relentless, and there's something about that relentlessness that makes me wonder, are we ever going to have a fair assessment of what the danger of this really is? Short of an objective science that is convincingly taking account of the arguments on both sides, I don't think so. So I want to see that robust debate emerge before I'm willing to say we should act in haste now, lest this uh, uh, danger overtake us. I would add that the uh, proponents of the precautionary principle uh, have a, a trick which I find distasteful. It's uh, the, the car salesman trick that says, uh, buy now because the price is going to go up next week. So what we have is the uh, uh, people who are promoting this view telling us that we can remediate the carbon dioxide problem today at a fraction of the cost that it would be next week, next month, next year, and so on. So you have to do it now. You have to panic. You have to drop any of this rational inquiry stuff and get to fixing the problem. When you're being stampeded towards an answer, my back goes up. I said, no, I don't want to be stampeded. Um, on the national security issue, I think that was just a brilliant maneuver on the part of President Obama to uh, order the American military to find a security issue where there is none. I have yet to find a convincing explanation of in what manner uh, global warming is supposed to pose this great danger to us. The, the hordes of immigrants that are going to be coming from Mexico because of uh, global warming, well, they're already here. Uh, and global warming apparently had nothing to do with it. Uh, the, we can see almost every security situation in the world, including the war in Syria now, as uh, stipulated as having something to do with global warming. Um, I think one has to bend a lot of logic in order to uh, turn these security issues into matters that have to do with uh, fractional changes of a degree in the temperature of uh, seawater, which is where we are on that. Um, on the externalized costs of fossil fuel production, the things that we don't take account of because people get uh, lung diseases and so forth, I agree, that's a real problem. But if we're going to look at the externalized costs of fossil fuels, we darn well better be looking at the externalized costs of the other forms of energy production. They all have them. I note that when you talk about solar, very few people are willing to talk about such things as the loss of productive land under giant solar collectors and uh, the cost to wildlife and things like that. It gets reported, but nobody's factoring that in as a cost of these things. So by all means, let's externalize the costs, include them in the full uh, energy audit that we're, we're talking about, but apply the same sauce to the goose and the gander. Actually, the environmentalists are going after the solar for, uh, for that. There have been some major controversies in the, in the West, uh, actually with, with respect to some animals, and you're seeing it in Massachusetts in, in terms of uh, using uh, using solar on farmland. So that it's the environmentalists who have, have taken yeah. the, the cut on that. Well, of course, the environmentalists are not always at ease with the, uh, the crony capitalist version of energy production. So I don't see this as a, an entirely unified movement. I tried to get that across. And finally, the subsidies such as uh, building uh, railroads and roads to transport fossil fuels. Uh, almost any form of energy has to be transported somehow. And uh, that's an, pretty much an elaboration of the externalized cost thing. Of course, the non-building of the Keystone Pipeline means that the railroads are benefiting tremendously. We're still getting uh, fossil fuels from Canada coming down, uh, simply going on railroads at a greater expense and a greater energy use than they would three, through a pipeline. Who's won on that one? I can't tell. The, uh, Warren Buffett, who is the uh, <laughs> primary owner of the railroads, is benefiting. Oh. Yes. Uh, 
Um, thank you for the talk, um, Peter. If sustainability is a replacement for religion, uh, insofar as that's true, is the deeper issue not the decline of religion, the death of God, the West? Um, smaller question, related question. If Americans, especially educated young Americans, are disposed to embrace some sort of apocalyptic, moralistic replacement for religion, isn't this one relatively harmless? I mean, wouldn't there be a danger instead of, we, we see a danger instead of a kind of radical egalitarianism, multiculturalism, identity politics, et cetera, that are, that are more directly hostile to freedom, especially freedom of inquiry. Um, you know, one might say, shouldn't we be glad that so much left liberal egalitarian fervor is spent on this, you know, issue where they're tilting at windmills and, you know, whatever? Be happy that they're playing in the sandbox and not yeah. doing something worse. Um, well, the once fashionable and maybe even widely accepted hypothesis that the West is secularizing seems to have uh, failed completely. We have uh, apparently uh, no great trend towards secularization at all, though we do have a lot of reshuffling of the religious uh, affinities of people. And to that extent, I see the sustainability movement as uh, uh, simply another option in the range of uh, religious uh, uh, formulations that are sort of on the market. Uh, is there a death of God involved? Uh, most of the sustainability movement, I think, would be fairly described as materialistic and not concerned with God, though Bill McKibben himself is a, a religious believer, a Methodist, um, and um, there is, if you attend things like uh, the People's Climate March in uh, New York City in September a year ago, uh, it was full of religious, not just symbol, but celebration of giant puppets of Mother Earth and uh, people dancing in homage before her and things like that. It would be hard to say that wasn't religious behavior. Uh, am I heartened by that? Um, uh, well, which would be worse? A bunch of atheists marching in grim determination down uh, uh, Fifth Avenue uh, or a bunch of uh, people in loincloths dancing in front of a symbol of Mother Earth? Uh, that's a choice I don't really want to make. Uh, both are distasteful. Uh, is it a moralistic religion that can be contrasted usefully with the radical egalitarianism that we see in some of these other movements? Uh, I think I'd have to chew that over a little bit. The, uh, the radical egalitarianism was sometimes there too, although one of the things that my uh, uh, co-author Rochelle Peterson took note of was that uh, at Swarthmore College, when they were initially organizing, they did it in a uh, Occupy style, where everyone was going to have an equal voice, and uh, you uh, ascended to people by snapping your fingers, and they had little hand signs they used. And it was all supposed to be uh, privileging nobody and giving everyone a fair shot. That lasted about a month or two, and they decided it would be better to be ruled by a triumvirate. They picked uh, their top leaders who began to meet in secret and uh, deter determine what it was that the popular will uh, really wanted. Um, uh, when Rochelle showed up at one of their supposedly open meetings, uh, they were, uh, had great trouble figuring out what to do to get rid of her. And uh, ultimately, they decided that uh, while the meeting was totally open, it was not totally open to her. And uh, she had to leave. Um, the egal radical egalitarianism never lasts. It's just a, a moment in uh, a radical movement's evolution towards some kind of dictatorship. And the uh, sustainability movement is hospitable to dictatorship. So I think the two are probably on the same path. That's an off-the-cuff answer. Yeah. Don't you think that there are, uh, in this movement, 
clear, chiastic, realistic traits which are uh, referable to Christianity. So on, on one hand, it seems that there is an attempt to shift to kind of geocentrism, if not cosmocentrism. But on the other hand, the movement seems to be still under the influence of Christianity. And perhaps the same idea of sustainability, except in very extreme cases, is still rooted in an anthropocentrism and humanism. So for this reason, I think that there are religious, secularized, religious, Christian traits. What do you think about this? Um, I think those are there. I guess I would to start drawing some distinctions between the the Christianized rhetoric and conceptual structure of the sustainability movement and Christianity per se is that well Christianity has given rise to any number of uh, sort of cultish declarations that we know what's going to happen and happen soon. The, standard Christian view is we know not the hour, um, whereas the standard view of the uh, sustainability movement is we know the hour, the minute, the second, it's going to happen. So there's a kind of uh, definiteness and uh, uh, kind of rigid pattern that is being played out in a uh, sustainability movement that better resembles uh, the uh, heretical bits of Christianity. I did my PhD on a, a heretical Christian cultic movement that was uh, some, in some ways like this. It predicted the end of the world. It knew exactly what was going to happen and in what order. Um, so it, it seems like familiar territory to me. Yes? In the last seminar, Harvey brought up an interesting <coughs> thesis or trend about sort of to anti-civilization and there seemed to be an element in part of what you described of people who are moving in that direction as if you know for eons we lived in a in primitive primitive mode technology and the comforts of civilization are relatively new over the last few hundred years do you detect that there is something maybe even psychological among some of the people of a desire, a drive, sort of to to not only get rid of civilization or leave civilization, but to destroy civilization and return back to uh, some, kind of, some kind of basic primitive tribal uh, scene. And and if so, what you know, where does that come from? Well, certainly, I see that as an element. Uh, there are students, and there's grown-ups like Bill McKibben who appear to be uh, uh, quite forthright in their desire to rid us of the burdens of civilization. Uh, it's not an entirely new impulse. There's been a strain of uh, romantic rejection of civilization that has been around for a very long time. Uh, I think you can glimpse it in uh, Thoreau's Walden, for example. Uh, it can be more thoroughgoing in today's world than it used to be because there are uh, antibiotics and uh, 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 sort of resources that uh, make it appear that the primitive life isn't so terrible. And the idea that uh, we would have uh, uh, infant mortality of 40 or 50 percent and uh, people would die of slow and horrible diseases or, or quick and sudden accidents in droves uh, doesn't seem to occur to people who uh, think that uh, the Paleolithic diet and uh, uh, thatched roof lifestyle is for them. Um, so why do they gravitate towards it? In part because there's a, a great gulf between their image of what it involves and what it actually would entail. Uh, second is that there's this uh, problem of ennui that comes with comfort and civilization. And uh, uh, yes, so a projection of uh, anti-civilization has a certain kind of appeal. I, I, I believe that is part of this movement. Do you think that um, 
dissatisfactions with individualism might fuel the allure of the movement? This is somewhat similar to Peter's question, but mm -hmm. I wondered when you mentioned the, uh, the consciousness of time and the awareness of future generations, I thought of what Tocqueville says about democracy separating the generations. And I wonder if part of the allure of sustainability as a movement is that it restores those ties. It gives you not only a community to be part of right now, but also makes you part of the, the whole human community now and in the future. I, I think there's an usness to it, yes. Uh, uh, McKibben has been pretty successful in saying this is the movement of your generation, and there are lots of was speaking to an activist on Tuesday about this. You know, this is ours. It's our thing. And so the sense of communitas is, is definitely there. Uh, but there's also a kind of fury that goes with that at people that you see as part of your generation that are saying, no, thank you. Th those are, uh, they're much more terrible than I am, that they, they refuse. Uh, yeah. Um, <coughs> It seems to me that it's at least conceivable that what you're describing is, is a movement <clears throat> or an attitude which in a sense has come to its uh, highest peak and is now entering, likely to enter into a time in which the opposing forces are going to get more powerful. For instance, as the uh, ideals of the movement get translated or tr uh, expressed through uh, uh, la larger and larger attempts at imposing an international policy as is about to happen, it, it seems to me very unlikely that there will be a, a warm acceptance of this in <coughs> the, uh, the seven-eighths of the world that still is deeply invested in growth. Uh, it seems to me that, you know, McKibben, we've got to rep recognize how unusual he is. First of all, he was a Harvard undergraduate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and a Crimson editor, so uh, very peculiar indeed. And his voice is hardly re reflective of the bulk of his or the ensuing generations, which are the millennials, etc., who, as far as I can see, they and their parents are deep into mansionizing in every conceivable con aspect of that concept. Now, I'm not sure how long these uh, uh, contradictions, as we used to say, uh, <laughs> uh, are going to uh, uh, be uh, overcome by a uh, ever more powerful uh, 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 an uh, in, in environmentalist uh, uh, sustainability movement. I mean, it seems to me there are inherent contradictions that are bound, inevitably bound, to keep growing. Well, I, I hope you're right about that. I, I don't think that it's written into any law of things that the uh, United States uh, needs to uh, prevail over its uh, contradictions. Uh, we may well be on a path towards uh, diminishing our own uh, capacities for self-governance and prosperity, uh, whereas other nations like India and China are on the path towards uh, certainly increasing prosperity, whether their freedom will come with that is another issue. But <clears throat> the um, um, Will this simply burn itself out on the basis that it doesn't truly make sense? Uh, I hope. Well, I don't expect that it will. Uh, it does seem to me that it speaks to a, a strain in modern society that is going to always be there. There will always be the attraction, uh, the religious, as you say, and other attractions that are implicit in the movement. It's just a question of relative impact, strength, dominance. And that is where I uh, look around at the world and what's likely to be coming and what are the attitudes of people who, who often can be uh, uh, contradictory. 
The same person can be totally devoted to a lifestyle which requires abundant energy, resources, etc., and be, devo and be c committed to, devoted to the concepts of sustainability. Uh, Salvador. <laughs> well, uh, I don't want to go to too extreme an example, but yes. <laughs> uh, or more particularly, Al Gore's houseboat. I don't know if any of you has ever seen a picture of Al Gore's oh, houseboat. Yes. Is there a <laughs> What it's might about be as a, large as an aircraft carrier. <laughs> what, what might be a bigger threat is uh, the research coming out of the University of Wales, which is predicting a new meander minimum. Yes. Uh, if we suddenly, 20 years from now, get very cold, we might, it might, uh, that might do, I don't know. I, I, I'm kind of skeptical about that, too, because I, I always bring up to my students the, the, global, the, 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 the global freezing hypothesis of the 1970s. And, washes right over them. They, it's just, you know, bad. <coughs> Their science is good and the other science is bad. Well, there, there is emergent evidence on several fronts that might be hard for the movement to cope with. The uh, evidence that the Antarctic ice sheet is growing rapidly and uh, there probably is no rise in uh, ocean levels. Uh, Greenland has two melting glaciers. That's they have to set that off against the enormous growth of uh, the ice cap in the Antarctic. And that's the debate. I go with the Antarctic. Um, On this uh, note of optimism. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Peter Wood. Thank you.